You're listening to TFM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. Hello and welcome to TFM's Local Watering Hole, and I am so glad to be here tonight as we have had a conjunction and it has allowed Christy Morris to return at last. The monolith has fallen, I've broken through. Uh, Well, you're so much better, you know, than that uh, evil witch that came through. So, Or the um, basilisk. Yeah, that- <laughs> yeah, you know, I just anytime a basilisk or a deathless mother comes through, I just I'm, it's not, I'm not I'm not a fan. Yeah, you know. No. So, well, thank you. It's good to be back. Well, uh, yes, this is going to be great. I am very excited, and um, it's it's just an exciting night. Um, we want to say a huge thank you to everybody who was listening. Uh, one, um, Christy, I don't know if you knew, uh, but we did get a brand new review here uh, from Apple Podcasts, and I wanted to read that out. Um, really wanted to thank uh, the listener who had done that. We connected over on the Babel Conference, and they said they would leave a review, and so Matt Malachy19 did, and he said, Chocked full of geeky goodness, five stars. I found this podcast after listening to a few other shows that the host Matt, Matt Rushing does. This show is full of interesting and diverse roundtable discussions to your favorite geek content, from superheroes to Star Wars to movies to TV, books, it covers it all. You're guaranteed to find something you'll enjoy here, so grab a seat and your favorite drink and listen in as if having a conversation with friends about all that we love. So thank you so much, Matt. Really appreciate you uh, giving us that review there on Apple Podcasts. And honestly, folks, you know, it's so true. And I wouldn't say it if it wasn't. Um, We still get most of the listens that we have through Apple Podcasts. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I really appreciate uh, people that do give us the reviews because it helps more people find the show. The more reviews you have, the easier it is in the Apple system to find the show. So really appreciate that. Also, I uh, want to encourage you that um, you can not only help out the show that way, but now that Spotify has really entered the game for podcasts, they've allowed you to be able to rate podcasts now. So if you're a Spotify user, please just give us a star rating. It's super simple. You don't even have to write anything. You could just give us a star rating over there, and that'll also help the show grow there. And of course, you can just find us wherever you get your podcasts, and you'll just make sure you want to, you'll just want to make sure you're subscribed. So that way you get the episodes as soon as they drop. Plus, we've got the bonus shows going on here in the feed. So, so much happening. Of course, you can find us on Twitter at The 602 Club as well as on Instagram at The 602 Club TFM. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm with the entire network. And then, of course, we're online at trek.fm, listeners-only discussion group. You can join and talk to listeners from all over the world about our shows. We've had some amazing conversations going on recently about our different episodes, so really want to appreciate everybody. Like, we love talking to you guys about this on the social medias, so, you Mm -hmm. know, please do connect with us, and we're there to talk to you about that. And uh, one of the things we wanted to do real quick, Christy, before we dive into anything else, uh, we did a little following contest over on uh, Twitter. And we've now got 281 followers. So thank you so much to everybody who's following us there. Hmm. Uh, if you're not, please still follow us. Um, but um, giving away a copy of Timothy Zahn's Heir to the Empire from the Essential Legends collection. And Craig Dickinson is our winner. So I want to say uh, congratulations to him. And Craig, hmm. all you need to do, just DM at the 602 club and send me your address and i'll get that book right out to you so uh one thanks for following us we really appreciate it and uh he actually does his own uh podcast so appreciate craig supporting us and um you know i'll give him a shout out check out reading between the reels so um Mm-hmm. Christy, one last thing we got to say is that we appreciate our associate producers here through Patreon, which is Ken Tripp, Davis Grayson, Ryan Millett, and Daniel Noah. Thank you guys for supporting the network through Patreon. Now, 
If you want the shows to keep uh, coming to you from Trek FM, we would really appreciate you going to patreon.com slash Trek FM and seeing how you can be part of this team. Um, it is pretty expensive to put uh, this network together every week with all of the different shows that we've got going on. We really would like to continue to grow the network. And if you want more shows coming to you, we really need your help. So again, go to patreon.com slash Trek FM. So, Christy, before we got to anything on our discussion outline, Mm -hmm. because I forgot to add this to the discussion outline, I wanted to ask you this. Um, Obviously, we both have seen uh, Witcher season one. We both really liked it. You can check out the review uh, from last year if you're interested. But this is a really big universe and something that I kind of wanted to basically just get out of the way first was this, is that... I don't know if you felt this way because I've never played the game and I've only read one of the books. So, um, and I, I'll probably continue to read some more of, of the books, but it felt like this season, it might have helped to kind of come in with a prologue or something Mm -hmm. um, to help you remember all of the chess pieces on the board that we have as well as just kind of the outline of this universe. Because for me, I, you know, watching the episodes really carefully, and it it's I found it sometimes difficult to follow everything that's going on with all of these different factions. Yeah, I, I'm actually 100% with you. I think that for someone who may be um, really steeped in this world completely already, you know, has has probably read multiple books or played the games before, you know, knows a little bit more about the world, that it would be easier to digest in that way. And it would be more, um, they would be more capable of catching Easter eggs, probably. Um, But I did notice that at least with, you know, I needed a recap coming into this season. It had been a little while since season one. And then also just, there's a lot of names. And although they're really cool names, Mm -hmm. some of them end up sounding similar, like Vizimir and (laughs) Vesemir. And I was like, wait, who's Vizimir? (laughs) Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that for the lay person like us, and I'm even, you know, less steeped in it than you are. um, You need a little bit of something, but I, I was still able to understand most of it, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I'm i right there with you in that sense. Like, I feel like you can understand most of it. I just felt like there are so many, you know, you have uh, the the northern kingdoms and the brotherhood. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then um, you've also got what's going on in Nilfgaard. You have the elves. And within that, you also have different little factions, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it can just be difficult because you haven't necessarily, unless you have, I think, read the books or maybe played the video game, you haven't spent hours in this universe. And so all of these things, like... I I even think, too, again, having a prologue with a map that has geography to it would help as well. So you have an idea in your brain. You know, I think that's one of the things that really helps with, say, like Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, if even if you were just seeing the movies, you know, they often showed maps in the movies of Middle Earth and where things were in relation to each other. So you yep. kind of had this idea and and that's one of the things that we don't really do here in this series which i'm actually kind of surprised at um and again i just think gosh a prologue could really help you have a sense of what's happening who's doing what and then at the same time just a general sense of like where things are happening and how far away they are from each other that i mean you know all that kind of stuff when you're watching something like this really, I think, helps. Yeah. Well, and especially when you're jumping through portals to different places or times, possibly, <laughs> that can be a problem. Yes. And I think, you know, thankfully, uh, and for a lot of people, I know a lot of people were kind of thrown with the first season where, you know, you had all of these 
uh, different time periods playing out, you know, and mm-hmm. they all finally converge at the end. Um, you know, the the distant past, the not so distant past, and then the present, and then they all kind of come together. You know, this doesn't have that happening. Everything is, you know, uh, all in the present. Mm-hmm. But um, it's just, again, like, I don't necessarily know how far Nilfgaard is from the Northern Kingdoms, you know, and right. where is Kaer uh, Moran in that, you know, comparatively to the rest of the, you know, people. And so, um, and I'm sure I could look up a map online, um, which, I, you know, I absolutely could. Um, but I think it just would be nice if they put it in the show. Yeah. Well, and and something big that you and I had discussed as well was, you know, we had recently reviewed the um, Witcher anime movie, Nightmare of the Wolf. And initially, I thought that it was going to be more of just a a one-off of, oh, here's some more background on the character and whatnot. But, you know, figured out that it wasn't um, Geralt's story it was his master Vesemir's story and then Geralt is just mm-hmm. a kid at the end right. so that actually ended up being a great prequel to this season mm-hmm. yeah no absolutely I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think you know again as, as we talk through any television show it's it's very difficult to talk through everything every single detail and in many ways I feel like it's much better to always just kind of talk through different characters. And and mm-hmm. one of the characters I think, you know, you and I loved Henry Cavill with uh, his portrayal of Geralt of Rivia. But I think they gave him a wonderful gift this season. And, and that was to allow him, you know, a lot of people loved the, you know, the memes of just him grunting or, you know, saying the F word. A bunch mm-hmm. of times, but I think here it was very nice that they just didn't continue that trend and they really allowed him to grow as a character. Oh, absolutely. He got to really show some range more. Um, I like that they leaned into really making his character more like a father figure to Siri, whereas before he had no interest in that um, as a character, you know he was completely going to turn his back on destiny, but he ended up feeling a real tie with her and realizing that maybe he's always wanted some semblance of family like that and to be needed by somebody in that way. Um, So yeah, I, I think that Henry does such a great job. And the reason why you and I both are such fans of his work is that he can really become a character, even though we've seen him do things like man of steel um, and, you know, the uh, mission impossible fallout movie, then he can come in and completely become Geralt of Rivia. And to me now, if I ever did play the games or read the book, he is Geralt to me because I think he, he leans into it so much. I have, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think this this season, I think, really showed that he does have such a range. And one of the things that I thought was really great with it is that it's not as though he went overboard from where he was in the previous season. But it was the way in which he was just doing little things. There are little mm-hmm. looks. There are little moments. And, and, and just the fact that Geralt is in a place where he is slightly more verbal you know yeah he's not a loquacious character but he is one here who like you said i think he takes to heart the idea of being series surrogate father Mm -hmm. and really caring for her and and being willing to do whatever it takes to keep her safe and obviously she responds to that but but i think he has found a new purpose in many ways. Like he has found an, uh, like being a witcher is really important to him, but this has gone above and beyond that because one, he realizes how special she is. And two, he has to figure out why she's so special so that he can best protect her. Mm -hmm. And what I really appreciated as well is that, 
you know, about a third of the way through the season, you know, he realizes he's just not good enough on his own. And so, you know, he begins to bring in other people to really help her, obviously bring her back to the Witcher Castle, as well as, you know, bringing in like Triss Mm -hmm. to help with training her because he understands, you know, she has some um, latent abilities, although he doesn't know quite why or how or anything. So all of that, I just, there's so much about this character to where we really move him forward and yet it still feels consistent with what happened in the previous season, but it was really just a joy to kind of watch him unfurl as a character. Yeah, I think that that's a really great way to say it, that he he loosened up some. He's no longer, like you were saying, the the grunting, annoyed person, but has become someone who really does kind of um, go against the grain of that whole thing that witchers don't have any feelings or that witchers can't feel love or pain or, you know, anything at all. They're just mutants. He's completely proven that wrong. And it's Mm -hmm. kind of ironic sometimes because he himself doesn't always want to feel things. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, like you can tell when he initially hears that Yennefer's probably dead, you can see the pain. And then again, when he's talking with the other wizard, um, or mage, I mean, um, and they're, (laughs) I did think that was kind of funny, by the way, that they're both past boyfriends of Yennefer and having that conversation of like, you know her, Mm -hmm. you know her. Yeah. Um, and then realizing she's not dead. That whole thing, like him saying that purely from his facial expressions, I thought he did such a great mm-hmm. job. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the the neat things about the portrayal and the character was, in many ways, I think this is the first time that, you know, he loved Yennefer, but he also realized in many ways that Yennefer as she was, was knowing was never going to let go of the desire for her own power. Yeah. And here, his love that he has for Siri has really taken over. And it is this familial fatherly type love to which has radically altered his perception on, you know, everything. And it's changed the way in which he is living his life. And I think, Mm -hmm. That's something that's really cool about the way that the character gets portrayed here. And it's it's just, uh, I mean, I, I feel like it's kind of hard to overstate just how much the character does grow in this season mm-hmm. and moves forward. And, and to me, I think, you know, loving him as an actor as I do... I was really thankful that he got this opportunity, that they gave him the opportunity to be able to have more range. I just think, you know, that that is very smart on their point, because I think otherwise you don't want the character to just kind of be this one trick pony. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, too, that this is very much in line with where the books probably take the character is as well. And and probably one of the reasons why Henry Cavill was so excited and desirous of playing this role in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, one thing I did want to add to that I thought was funny about the familial love between him and Siri, I had heard somewhere that actually part of the reason he brings in Triss to train some with Siri was um, obviously like to, the general audience it's partially because they're both women and he feels that there's some things that only women understand about each other that Triss can help her with um mm. but also that it could have been that um she was getting picked on by some of the other witchers about um having her period <laughs> apparently <laughs> and that She, um, you know, in that one scene where she was trying to, like, look cute and pretty, that that was kind of alluding to that, possibly. So if that's the case and someone can let me know, that would be really funny. But it was a a nice little nod to, like, although Siri wants to be 
just as good as any of the male witchers, that there are some things that she has to deal with that are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Right. And in all reality, those men are not the ones that really help teach her about that because they have no idea. Yeah. Um, Yeah. No, absolutely. I I think all of that's great. And, And, you know, on top of that, I think one of the things that's really cool about his growth and the fact that we get to spend time with like Vesemir and the other witchers, um, as well as we get the background of the witcher history, their creation after the conjunction, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the belief that, uh, they are, um, were most likely first started from, uh, contents of elder blood to help with the mutations that make witchers. And so I think all of that too really added to, uh, just the depth of the storytelling, not only for Geralt, but of course, just witchers in general. And, and then, I think by allowing us to spend so much time with him and with the rest of them, it's also what makes that ending where so many of them get killed so much more painful as well because there are so few of them left. Yeah, and and that brings back that point that seeing the anime movie is so great to do Mm -hmm. before you watch this season because it informs you about some of that and gives a lot Mm -hmm. more depth of emotion to those scenes. Um. And it brings about the question that comes up again in this season of um, whether the witchers and the mages are creating monsters in order for there to be a need for witchers. Mm -hmm. And this proves that's not necessarily true, that the monsters are coming from somewhere else. Yep. Yep. 100%. No, I'm glad you said that because, again very much ties into to what we saw um, and does really help answer, I think, that question. And yeah, we see... And and I think the beauty of that is that the animated movie had allowed us to see that there is there was one answer that that was the case. There were people that were um, doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, but here, that's not happening anymore. Right. Um, what, what's actually happening is that... You know, these monoliths are uh, breaking open because of series screams and um, they're causing the connection between these other spheres where these monsters come from to connect. And so, yeah, I loved all that. I, again, getting more about how this world works was really, really cool. And, you know, that's a big part of Siri. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, with her as a character, we get an opportunity to kind of understand her history more the fact of who she is what she is and i think that to me was was really fascinating to find out i mean i always had the feeling that she was going to be kind of like a one character like the one Mm -hmm. um but to kind of see how deep that goes is it was really really fascinating yes the way that they connected her to everything else in the what makes the world what it is, you know, how she relates to this conjunction, how they show, you know, with the hut and things, the um, sort of like hieroglyphics on the walls and stuff of how the conjunction happened and what it resulted in. Um, mm-hmm. it, it just really helps with kind of tying everything together and helping it make sense um, mm-hmm. so that ultimately for one, along that journey, I don't know about you, but I was coming up with theories as to what I thought series part in it was going to be and then realized I was wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the show does give you the opportunity to be able to ask a lot of questions about who she is. But then as it begins to answer them, you just find it really, I, I it's so cool. And I think, you know, it made sense, like, being able to tie some of these things together a little bit, the idea of, you know, um, that why the elves are so important, you know, mm-hmm. and the the fact that they have this elder blood and this connection and basically that she is this prophesied elven weapon, you mm-hmm. know, um, who's going to have this connection, that's going to have this power And it's going to allow her to possibly hear um, she could either be 
an instrument of mass destruction, basically, or she could be the thing that leads to peace finally. Mm -hmm. And so I think obviously that's what that gives us too is like who's training her and it, and all of that is really, really important. And I think, you know, it's, it's one of the things that was so scary about this season of her possibly falling into the wrong hands, you know, um, mm-hmm. and because she could be trained to be a person that would just, you know, wreak havoc on the continent. Right. Well, and I mean, she she basically is like. Well, she is this impressionable young girl who whoever comes in and tries to mold her, she's going to believe has her best interest at at heart. And that's what sometimes is her weakness, because that's what happens when Mm -hmm. she trusts Yennefer, unfortunately. Um, But then that's how Geralt can come in and save Ciri from herself, basically, Um and I, I really liked that tie that possibly her power is the bad side of Siri that could be used for evil to destroy everything. But her blood could be because, you know, all of the elves were um, killed off mm-hmm. in genocide, that there's only a few left. Her blood could be the thing that they're able to use to bring about more elves. Mm-hmm. Or as Vesemir was or, showing, more yeah. witchers. Yeah, the possibility of that too. Yeah, absolutely. No, I I thought that was uh, you know really really interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I one of the things that I really appreciate about her story too was was the very end. You know where she's being tempted to kind of stay in this reality that's not reality to stay in this alternate reality this this reality that's only in her mind and Mm -hmm. you know what i really loved about that is just i think the importance of the lesson of that you know you can't just make reality whatever you want it to be how in the end Geralt tells her you know it's not perfect but it is real and Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a beautiful lesson of, you know, the, like the Matrix um, teaches us, the original that is. And I think, you know, this is reminding us that you, what you make up in your mind doesn't, it's not real, you know. And if you live in that reality, um, you are going to get lost in it and it, it it's not going to mean anything because it's it, mm-hmm. you're not r- living in in something that comports with reality and it's it's better to be a part of something that is not perfect like Geralt says but is actually experienceable like mm-hmm. and the things that are happening to you are actually things that matter because they are real well and that you're not running away from your problems and trying to make your own reality. You know, I I think that's yes. part of it too is that she's she wants so much to have a relationship with her parents that she never met, um but also she's hiding. You know, she can kind of tell in that moment that something is not right and that obviously her parents can't be alive because she knew that they died. I mean, she had never met them for a reason. She was raised by her grandmother for a reason. But she still went along with it anyway because she just wanted so much for it to be true. So, yeah, I think that's a a really great point that what Geralt says to her about it, it, Mm -hmm. at least what she and he have is like a real family, even though it has its flaws and he's never going to be able to replace her father that he's going to do the best he can to take care Mm -hmm. of her. Yeah. Well, and I like what you said there because just because you wish something to be true doesn't mean it actually is true. Mm -hmm. And that desire to consistently live in the, basically a lie, is going to be damaging in the end, right? And... 
Um, I, I thought that that was interesting because in many ways, you know, that's one of the big growth moments for her is to overcome that. And part of that, I think, is the is the connection that she ends up having with the real. It's the connection with Geralt. It's the connection with the other witchers. Uh, it's even the connection that, with Yennefer. All of these things help drag her back to reality. And I kind of loved that. You know, we spent all this time with her training and learning to be, um, you know, uh, be able to fight and to grow and all that. I loved her kind of doing the, I like to call it the Continent Ninja Warrior obstacle course. Oh, yeah. Um, which was which was really fun. Um, but that drive, in many ways, like, it, she wants to be like her adopted father Mm -hmm. right she wants to be like Geralt because she sees his strength she sees his goodness Uh, she sees all the things to which she wants to emulate and I think part of this series for her is it does become about you know who do I imitate you know who's Mm -hmm. worth imitating because not everybody is you know and uh, I think that's a lesson that we all end up having to learn in our lives. Who Who's worth imitating in our lives and who's not? And mm-hmm. Siri, you know, finds that out the hard way. Um, and I just, yeah. And I love the actress that plays her. I think she's really good. Um, I think she does a great job of being able to play um, somebody who's younger, um, but also, you know, somebody who has a lot a lot of grit and uh yeah freya allen i i mean her and henry cavill together they have a a good on-screen chemistry um that really helps you enjoy you know watching them on screen together as this kind of father and daughter duo yeah the thing that i really love about their relationship especially toward the end as well is that he really reminds the audience as well as Siri that mute, um, sorry, witchers are mutants and that it's a lot harder for them to die because they have these elixirs and things that have completely changed their DNA. Whereas with her, just the obstacle course could kill her. <laughs> and he's like, and I can't bring you back. <laughs> So I kind of need you to be careful. <laughs> I, I wish it's you like were the, the same. I can't bring you back from the dead. It's not a pretty sign. Right, I yeah. don't like doing it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I, I thought that that was a great point that they made sure was included in the dialogue um, because we tend to forget that. And she does. I love that they give her that tenacity, though, that she's like, I'm going to do this. I'm No matter how many times I get knocked down, no matter how much it hurts, I'm going to keep doing it until I get it perfect. Um, But it's hard. I mean, they make it like she initially thinks she is the golden child because of her powers and that she can do anything. And it's like, uh, not necessarily. (laughs) You know, uh, it's like she's in a Chumbawamba song. I get knocked down and I get up Mm -hmm. again. You're never going to keep me down. Exactly. um, Yeah. Yeah. No, I I thought what was really interesting, too, was the way in which we kind of layer in with Yennefer's story. And I think one of the things that really struck me about what she's going through is that Yennefer is a character to which she has this void that she's trying to fill in her life. And she's always thought that that void would be filled by being able to fix her beauty, you know, to become beautiful, Mm -hmm. um, to get this power with the chaos. She's thought all of these things would fulfill her. And what she's finding is, is that fulfillment can't come from these type of sources. Like that, that's not really what's going to make her a whole person. And, And I just really, I really appreciated this because like, it really kind of comes down to in the end, what are we putting our faith in? And she's been putting her faith in all of these things to try and make her whole, mm-hmm. and none of them can fulfill her. Um, and and part of that has to do with the fact that really she'll do anything to fill this void, and therefore, you know, she is. Betra- she portrays people. You know, she um, 
pushes people away and you know all the things that could actually be more fulfilling which is to be selfless and to be um somebody who loves she's pushing away now mm-hmm. uh, all, and and I think I just I really responded to that as a thematic element and a story point because you know that's also kind of the fear that you would have for Siri as a character for her to make that choice at the end right because she wants that thing to fulfill her she wants that thing so badly will she do anything to get it you know to get her parents um and you know is she going to follow the Yennefer model or is she going to follow the Geralt model Mm -hmm. and that's a thousand percent the the huge thing that I noticed about Yennefer as well is that she definitely is someone who's constantly searching And, you know, like you were saying, it's this void in her that she thinks is going to be filled by having more power, by having more magic, by having a child, which she tries to get the djinn for from season one. Um, And then she realizes every time that she ends up leaving empty. And then finally here, you see that, again, every time she is selfish, she is punished and every time she's selfless she's rewarded so you know when she um basically puts her life on the line at the end of season one to save everyone from um fringilla's fire magic um we think that she died trying to save them and then she ends up surviving um and I, I love that they have her finally decide that even though she initially um, completely betrayed Geralt and gave up Siri to the Deathless Mother, that she redeemed herself by offering her body as a vessel mm-hmm. to take the Deathless Mother out of Siri's body and into her own mm-hmm. and then end up being brought back. So... You know, yeah. and and I like that they didn't make it easy for her to then get forgiveness from Geralt. I'm glad mm-hmm. that he says, you know, that's a start, but you've got a long way to go. Yes. Yeah, I appreciated that, too, because when you think about the way in which that he betrayed her and then you put that on top with the way in which he almost in which she almost betrayed him completely again when it comes to Siri. I mean, she had until she stopped mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and put Siri in, in real danger. And so, you know, I, I think what what and this plays out with her and with other people in the series. But I think it, you know, with Yennefer, we see the theme of like living with the choices we make. You know, we have to, to pay for the consequences of our actions. And she has a lot of consequences to the actions to which she has done. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't always mean, yes, you can find forgiveness. You you can do the right thing or whatever. But that doesn't mean that everything's just going to be hunky-dory, you know, afterwards. Right, it's not a race. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And so, no, I really think, um, you know, she is such an interesting character, and I love the kind of I, I love the fact that season one and season two were really about her coming to that place where she was willing to let go of herself mm-hmm. and just what she wants and and learn that life is meant to be not lived for ourselves, but be meant to be lived in service of others, and that that's what actually can bring true joy and true fulfillment and happiness and purpose and that she found that purpose in the sense that she was willing to die she had no idea that she was going to live that she was going to be able to get her powers back she's willing to basically die and be in prison forever uh if po- if needed if that's what it take if that's what it took to save siri mm-hmm. and you know um uh, I think it's it's great because now we end this with this little family unit, basically, mm-hmm. um, that's going to be on the run 
to work to continue to train this young girl to be the right type of hero that the continent needs. And oh boy, does this continent need a hero because, <laughs> uh, you know, I need a hero. Uh, anyway, nice. sorry. Um, because this continent is driven by nothing but fear and a desire to dominate other people. Like, nobody here is good. Like, you know, even when you think of the plight of the elves and what's been happening to them for generations upon generations upon generations, like, nobody's act, like, nobody's really redeemable. Mm -hmm. um, right now you know everybody is only thinking about themselves and what they can get out of things and and so yeah this continent is in desperate need of a hero yeah i'm hoping that we're really going to see some positive things happening now that Geralt, siri and yennefer have been through what they've been through together um and come out realizing that they're stronger being selfless people and working together because you're right. I mean, it, it's it's a mess. <laughs> um, you have all of these different factions that just want to overtake each other. It's like a, a different version of Game of Thrones, um, except this probably came first, actually. Um, but it it's Nilfgaard. It's the elves. It's the, um, oh, what is it? The Brotherhood? No, the, it starts with an R. Oh, yeah. Redania. I yeah, reading, there you go. Yeah. Um, all of them have their devious plans that they're trying mm -hmm. to take over one another. Um, but the big linchpin in it now is that several of them now know that Siri has elder blood mm -hmm. and there's a hit out on her head and anyone that protects her. So a line has been drawn in the sand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, actually really glad that um you know in this season two we finally got to explore you know more of the elf story and you know theirs is a terrible story uh of you know being used in oppression and um i think it is really well told i'm really glad we got to spend time with them so we could begin to empathize with them more on a personal level um for what happened to them which is just awful um, when you think about what happened with Francesca and Philodrandrel's uh, child, you know, being killed and uh, just, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm left with just the, this third season. I'm, I can't wait to see what happens because it's terrible. And so, um, and I think one of the big things is the very end of the show you know, we end with this huge reveal of who the White Flame of Nilfgaard is uh, and the fact that it's actually Ciri's father, somehow not dead in an accident in the ocean, but actually alive. And the person who's been behind all of this, not only the, the, uh, the death of Francesca's child, but also... The reason why they knew about her powers. They right, know... like Nilfgaard knew before everyone else. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, to me, that was a huge reveal. And, and I, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, if I'd read the books, I probably would have known this coming in, obviously. But this is one of the, I, I enjoyed not knowing, like, like just being surprised and like the whole time wondering who this character is. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, because it's built up so much. I mean, even from the first season when Kahir first mentions him, um, it seems like it's going to be a god and that we're possibly never going mm -hmm. to actually meet a personification of whatever the white flame is until finally mm -hmm. at the end of this season we do. But the, now it's raised all these other questions because you're not sure why he would have made this drastic of a turn. Because obviously he fell in love with Siri's mother um, and didn't feel the same as her mother did about her powers. Um, and so why would he not have stayed with her 
what happened between the two of them that led him to this epiphany. And then now why is he taken on this mantle of destruction? And it seems like wanting to purely use Siri to gain more power instead of reunite with his daughter. Yeah. And I mean, it does raise questions about what happened to her mother, you Mm -hmm. know? And so, I mean, I think it is uh, this, this, end of the season leaves us with a lot of questions because you know we also didn't learn who like the master of um lydia was and Mm -hmm. you know the the fire well the fire dude Uh (laughs) yeah we can't say his name um but um you know why uh, and what their whole plan is and what this person is after so you know, I mean, there's there's so much left up in the air, and then too, you know, we have the the whole reveal of you know being in the other sphere and seeing this wild hunt mm-hmm. and what that all means. Which you know, again, as as a somebody who hasn't played the game and hasn't which and hasn't read the books, which everything is based off upon, I don't know what any of that means. But I'm really excited to find out because this is, it's such a great, I don't know, I I haven't been this excited since uh, like about a fantasy series and what's going to happen next as I was when I was like watching, you know, the seasons of Game of Thrones and Mm -hmm. trying to figure all that out. Yeah, I'm with you. I think that the initial introduction of this with all of the timelines really hooked me. And then I think even though they did it different structure wise this season, that it still captivates you every episode. You know, you've got to know how the episode name factors into what's happening in each one. Um, How are these big questions going to be answered? And then, you know, like we were saying, now they've tied in this other Um, animated movie into the story I I think that it's Mm -hmm. really showing that this world has a lot to give and that it's a fascinating story well and I also think too one of the things that I really liked about this season was the way in which it 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 started off relatively slow on purpose in like a very self-contained story of you know siri and Geralt looking for a place to stay and they end up staying with a friend of his and Mm -hmm. you know they end up facing a monster there and it seems like a very very self-contained story and yet it begins that theme of one living with the consequences of your actions and two being careful of what you love because what you love can control you in and in terrible ways, mm-hmm. right? What you give your love to can control you. So, I mean, I, I think this season was really well paced. I didn't find any time during the season where I'm like, why are we doing this episode? You know, yeah. I think um, I, that's one of the things that I really appreciated. Like, I was never bored or like, what's going on or why are we telling this part of the story? Like, um, I think the only thing that would have been nice is just to sometimes have a little bit more context to all of these political machinations happening with all of these different factions Mm -hmm. and sometimes feeling a little bit lost as to exactly who we were watching and what their plan is and how that plan impacted other plans, you know, because there really is quite a bit going on. But I also think that's what makes the show rewatchable too. Yeah, because you have to go back and watch it to catch some additional things you may have missed the first watch through. So, yeah, I, I'm with you there. Um, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that first episode as well, because I completely forgot that I, I did want to say a big thing that I took away from that episode um, of Geralt's friend who's been cursed to looking like a beast Um we find out it's a phrase that he says to Siri when he's telling her good night, um, who the real monsters are, you know, that he's saying that it don't be deceived. You know, what looks like a monster physically may actually not be what it is within. And then what looks kind on the outside may be actually a monster on the inside. Mm -hmm. So, right. You know, 
Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I, that all applies to just the way we see the um, deathless mother, you know, dragging all of these people in and promising basically to give them what they want if they do what she wants. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, the, the whole idea of making deals with the devil, uh, you know, be careful who you're making deals with. Mm-hmm. You know, I think all of this is just... Uh, there's there's so much here. It's so rich. And 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 one of the things that I really have to give this show credit for as well is one, the cinematography and the look of the show. Yeah. There are very few times where I felt like things just looked ridiculously fake. But um even the mass sweeping shots you get of places like Sentra and stuff look great, I thought. Um, you know, I, I think the only time is sometimes the monsters and, and that's to be expected, you know, uh, when you're on a, even a Netflix budget, which, you know, their television shows can be very budget heavy, you, you're still not going to be motion picture quality. Um, and that's fine. But I mean, for the most part, this show looks great and the places they're filming there and I, you know, I know they're filming in Europe and on on the European continent and it just looks gorgeous. So I've got to give it to this show that, you know, they took I think a big lesson from Game of Thrones which is location shooting and and really took that to heart and it, it it's it's really really good. So, yeah, I think that they do such a great um, thing with making the expansive shots look so much bigger than we think the world is, um, especially like the shots of Kaer Morin, seeing that um, originally mm-hmm. in the animated movie and then now here in the sort of more realistic look. Um, they definitely make things feel larger than life, even with the restrictions they had with the filming um, and with trying to do all of this in and out of, you know, COVID concerns is really remarkable. <laughs> so uh, it high five for that. Um, and I, I also wanted to ask you as far as the music, how did you feel about the uh, composition compared mm-hmm. to season one? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think it's good. I really enjoyed it. I, I think it continued on the trend from the first season. Um, uh, this is Joseph Trepanzi, I think is how you'd say his last name. So it's a different composer than it was for the first season. Um, but I really enjoyed it, you know. And, and then, of course, I think what we get um, song-wise is, again, fun as um, as Yaskier comes back, you know, as well, which is a lot of fun. And um, so, no, I think uh, the music was, a, again, a, a good part of the show, you know, and I enjoyed the the work just throughout the episodes in, you know, bringing the right amount of tension or a right amount of kind of like heroism for a moment, or I think all of that was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was how I felt as well. I I especially noticed Yaskier's new song, um, not quite as catchy as Toss a Coin to Your Witcher, but still good. Um, And nice to have Yaskier back, by the way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know there were a lot of people excited about the reunion of Yaskier and Geralt. (laughs) Mm -hmm. which was fantastic um yeah you know i love that uh gerald apologizes and you know um and and i think what's really great is in many ways you know even as we talked about gerald's growth is that one of the things that i think he's realized is that it's okay to have other people be a part of your life even though you know and 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 for him it's difficult because he outlives everyone right Mm -hmm. um and so uh, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, most witchers kind of stay to themselves other than dalliances with, you know, people in bars. It, it, it He's allowing himself to connect in a way that he hasn't before. And it's making him a better person, so, which is great. Mm-hmm. So I'm really, really excited. Um, well, I mean... I'm wondering then, you know, what you would end up rating season two uh, here for Witcher. So obviously we just raved about everything pretty much. Um, I think that we both felt the same as far as there needing to be some kind of either more of a prequel or um, 
a recap or a prologue or something at the beginning, something to give you a little more background before you're the average person thrown into this second season without a lot to go on. Um, but otherwise, really, the the only things um, that I think maybe took off some points for me were, I think that maybe the um, character of uh, Rience, I think is his name, the fire mage character Mm -hmm. could have been explained a little bit more, but maybe that's also intentional. Um, And overall Mm. just really was impressed with it otherwise. So I have to give it a four and a half out of five um, medallions because it had a lot of really cool things still going for it. I loved uh, the excitement of seeing that there is definitely a season three coming Mm -hmm. Um, and wanting to know what's going on with Siri's father and where they go from here. No, I'm not sure that I could really add anything to what you've said. I mean, I I think everything you said about, you know, the things that I might have added, you know, are 100% true. Um, But that didn't really detract from the fact that I really enjoyed the series like this this season was 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 good it was mm-hmm. really good and so yeah i think i would probably give it the exact same rating of uh four and a half out of five because you know it comes to a television show i want to feel like this when i come out of it which is that i enjoyed it that i had a great time uh, and that i want to see the next season mm-hmm and so I'm 100% on board, you know, with season three. I can't wait for it. And yeah, I can't wait to see what they do. So, um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm really glad that, you know, and I'm sure for a lot of people that this season was probably a slightly better season for them in the viewing just because people weren't confused. I know a lot of people got confused in the first season about what was happening and why, you know, Mm -hmm. they, it took them a long time to figure out the time jumping. Um, This is not like that at all. And therefore I think many people are going to, if you liked the first season, you're going to love this season because of that. And if you maybe were mediocre about the first season, you might really love this season just because of that fact as, as well. So I think they did a great job. Um, mm-hmm. But it is time, Christy, for some recommendations. And I'm really excited to see what you're going to be recommending to everybody this week. So I'm not sure if I've recommended this before, but even if I have, I think it bears mentioning again. Um, if you have not checked out a YouTube show called Good Mythical Morning, hosted by best friends, Rhett McLaughlin and Link Neal. Do yourself a favor and look it up. It's called GMM or Good Mythical Morning. Um, This year is the 10 year anniversary of their show. And these are two guys that grew up in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina, and ended up moving their families out to LA and started this, which is now a company that they do full time as their main source of income. Um, on their own. So I, I think that it's really impressive that they've been able to do it for 10 years and provide for their families and have several kids each and get to spend every day having a blast with their best friend. And they're hilarious. I've My husband is probably sick of me watching their gag reels by now. But yeah, uh, so definitely check them out. They're awesome. Nice. Um, well, I am excited so I love, you know, like when we get in like a new show um, to kind of check out. And um, and so I was excited that this was coming out. And um, my wife and I kind of during um, really, I guess, the, the midway through COVID season, we decided to uh, watch all of Downton Abbey. Yeah, we ended up really enjoying Downton Abbey and liking it. And the creator of Downton Abbey has a brand new show called The Gilded Age on HBO Max. Just started. In fact, my wife and I were watching it before recording. So I'm going to recommend that because already enjoying it. Um, And it definitely has a lot of the same type of feel uh, that you got from Downton Abbey, which you would expect. 
um, but it's set in New York um, during the Gilded Age, and you know, right at the turn of the century there um, of the from eighteen hundred to nineteen hundred. So um, very fun, and uh, I would say it's quite more ambitious than Downton Abbey was in the sense that you know you're setting a show in New York, and so even just to do that. There's so much more to do for the show because, you know, you're having to create Manhattan um, from the 1800s, you know, digitally and those kind of things. So, but I'm I'm really interested to see where the show goes. And, you know, it's, it's fun to have this type of show back. In fact, I was mentioning to my wife, you know, it's really weird that we watch these type of shows because really what we're watching is basically the Kardashians from these different time periods because that's what these people were the rich and famous you know right and um and so i just think it's kind of funny but it i i definitely recommend checking it out and, and seeing what you think there on hbo max so but christy if uh you know people do want to catch up with you and see what else is going on for you these days where can they find you you can find me on Instagram and Twitter, of course, at Bespin Bell, and then hanging out in the Babel Conference sometimes. And when I'm not there, um, I am also doing a show with my good friend, Amanda Pfeiffer, who you may have heard recently on this show as well, as she's now making more appearances. Um, I do a show with her called Sabres and Spells on the Skywalking Through Neverland Network, Skynet. And we actually just recorded a new episode that I'm releasing this week, all about her and Eric's geeky Star Wars slash Harry Potter wedding. So hope that you will check that out on Sabres and Spells. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah, we're excited to have Amanda, who will be joining us more often these days um, yeah. here on, in the 602 Club, which, you know, is, is just it's just fun to have more people to be able to join us. But uh, you could find me all over the place, of course, under the moniker Matt Rushing 2 Instagram, Letterbox, Twitter, Vero, all of those type of places. You could find me here in the network, of course, with the Bonus shows inside the 602 feed with John Mills, with, of course, the Snyder Cuts, as well as Assembling Avengers. Uh, as, of course, right now, Assembling Avengers is hot, hot, hot as we are going through Phase 3 of Marvel. And um, as of this week, we'll be hitting Guardians of the Galaxy 2. You can also find me doing The Orb, Literary Treks, and Warp 5. The Orb is about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Literary Trex is about the books and the comics of Star Trek, and Warp 5 is about Star Trek Enterprise. And then over on the Nerd Party Network, I've got two shows. One is a completed show called Owl Post. I did that with Drea Kaufman, and we talked about every single chapter of the Harry Potter series, one chapter at a time. And then John Mills and I talk about Star Wars on Aggressive Negotiations, and as we're recording uh, this episode, the new episode is dropping... So I hope you will check that out. But thank you so much for joining us. And y'all come back now, you hear? 